Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes, thank you for the introduction. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, the characterization of entanglement embezzlement. This is a work that I did together with uh, Thomas, who is here in the audience, and, uh, and Gilad Gur. So I will divide this talk into, into parts. In the first part, I will go through the approximate conversion problem in NOCC. This is a strongly physically motivated extension of the usual conversion problem in LOCC. And then we will use the results that we found in the first part to characterize entanglement and embezzlement. And somehow to show that the first family of states that give entanglement and embezzlement is somehow unique. And um, we care about entanglement and embezzlement because uh, it's strongly related to catalysis. So in some way, it allows to do some operations that otherwise would be forbidden. And it has been proved useful in many applications. For example, one of which is the simulation of uh, noisy channels with noiseless ones. So it's a result known as the quantum reverse channel uh, here. So to start, we do a, a small step back and we talk about the conversion problem just to set up uh, uh, the stage. So one interesting question in LOCC, but in general in any resource theories, is if uh, uh, it is possible to convert a bipartite state Psi into another bipartite state Phi using only LOCC operation. In this presentation, we will always assume that both states are bipartite states on AB, and the dimension of AB are the same. This can be done without the loss of generality. The conversion problem, at least for pure state, is solved. It's, there is this nice result known as uh, Nielsen theorems uh, that says that one can convert two agents, Alice and Bob usually are called, can convert psi into phi with uh, LOCC, uh, if and only if uh, all the chi phi norms of Q are bigger than the chi phi norms of P. And the chi phi norms are uh, easier way to write the sums at the bottom of the first k largest Schmidt coefficients of uh, psi and phi respectively. So this is uh, a well-known result. For people that know and work with majorization, we can say equivalently that q majorizes p. And we point out another way to express the result. It's at the bottom that we will come useful later. This is exactly equivalent to the first condition. What do we mean with the approximate conversion? Well, with the, the standard conversion, the goal was to convert psi into exactly uh, phi. That may not always be possible, but in some sense, in, it's meaningful to consider not only phi, but all the states that are epsilon close to phi with respect of some distance. And it makes sense because physically, with an experiment, one may not be able to distinguish phi from a state close, very, very close to it. So it's very meaningful to ask, can I convert psi into a state that is epsilon close to a state phi? So I don't want phi exactly, that's called exact conversion, but it's enough for me to have some kind of approximate conversion. And I want to do it using only uh, LOCC. <laughs> One way to tackle this problem is to introduce conversion distances. For example, if you'd like to work with the uh, trace distance, you can see that the conversion distance for converting psi into phi is, uh, uh, you, know, you start with psi, you apply any LOCC protocol, you measure, you see where you get it, you measure the distance from the states that you get and the target state phi, and then you take the smallest of these distances. These are called uh, uh, conversion distances. And here, for example, we do it with trace distance, but you could do an exactly the same definition, for example, with the purified uh, distance. There is a problem with uh, these definitions, uh, is that usually the minimization is very difficult to, to compute. And in particular, LCC, a lot is known, but as a set, it's very difficult to end. You know? There is one way, two ways, three ways, n ways. It's very difficult to 
characterize and check for all uh, possible uh, all possible results. What we do is to propose a slightly different conversion distance. We call it star conversion distance. And uh, our approach was saying, instead of considering all the possible outcomes of the protocol, let's just think about the cases in which we reach a pure state. In that case, what we get is a pure state and we can apply Nielsen theorem. So instead of looking at the states themselves, we can look at the regimic coefficients. So these two conditions are simply saying, oh, I do them is a minimization of a pure states only. And so I switch everything from states to their Schmidt coefficients. In principle, these distances could be very different. We are doing minimization over a different set uh, using a different way of computing distances. But it turns out that they are topologically equivalent. So one bounds the other from above and below. So they both go to zero at the same, uh, at the same time. For the people that work with the purified uh, distance and like the conversion, the purified distance model, I, it's worth mentioning that this result, this topological equivalence, is based on a stronger result on the purified distance. So if one defines all the quantities, the d and the d stars, using the purified distance, one actually gets uh, that, uh, in the case for the purified distance, d and d stars are actually equal, not only equivalent, but equal. We, stay, we stick with the one defined with the trace distance because we were able to find a closed form expression for it. So this is actually quite uh, interesting because, as I said in the previous slide, uh, it's usually quite difficult to do the minimization. But thinking about only pure states and uh, defining uh, the star conversion distance in a good way, we were able to find a close form expression for the star conversion distance. In the rest of the talk, we will switch always from D to D star because they are topological equivalent, and for pure states, this star is much easier to, to use. At the beginning, I said that, that this way of characterizing the, the standard commercial problem will be useful later, and here it is, because you can see that there is a nice equivalent between the exact conversion problem and the approximate conversion problem. So I can do an, an exact conversion if the maximum of that quantity is zero. And they can do an appro epsilon approximate conversion. Here, epsilon is with the star conversion distance if the maximum of the quantity is smaller or equal than epsilon. So the two things are actually related. And we see that if epsilon is zero, we recover Nielsen theorem as we expect. Now we use these results to characterize entanglement and embezzlement. And to give a hint, an idea of what we mean with embezzlement, we do when we use a a uh, geometric example. So uh, suppose that one of you gives me the first triangle. The first triangle is made of some kind of rare material, gold or something that is very expensive. And I have to hold it for you for a certain period of time. I study the triangle and I realize that if I cut and I arrange the pieces from the, from the first triangle, I can obtain a second one that is that looks very much like the first one. Like it's almost impossible to spot the difference with naked eyes, but I was able to embezzle. Well, no, I was able to embezzle the small black square. So you gave me something, and I was able to embezzle from it a small square by changing just a bit the original triangle. Out of this example, we when we talk. Uh, of universal embezzling family, family N, we, we mean that it's a family such that for every state sigma and for every epsilon, so whatever approximation I choose, there exists an N and a state in the family such that they can convert chi N into a state that is epsilon closer to chi N tensor sigma. So similarly to what happened with the triangles, we start with chi N and we go to a state that is chi, very close to chi N tensor sigma. The same definition can be expressed as a limit. Epsilon and then is the classical definition of the limit. So we say that we have a universal embezzling family if that limit goes to zero. In uh, at the beginning, I said that there is a strong relation between embezzlement and catalysis. 
Usually, when we talk about catalysis, we talk, we talk about a state now such that uh, even if such that there are, there are rowing sigma, such that even if it's not possible to convert a row into sigma with LOCC, it is possible to convert a row tensor tau into sigma tensor tau with LOCC. So tau makes some conversions that otherwise were impossible, it makes them possible. In this sense, Cayenne is some kind of universal catalyst with respect to the approximate conversion. But I put the approximate in parentheses because we can make the approximation arbitrary small. Indeed, for every epsilon and for every rho and sigma, so it works for every rho and sigma, we can find an end such that the rho tensor chi can be converted in something epsilon close to sigma tensor chi. So well, the first thing is just discard rho and then apply the definition of universal embezzling family. And it's clear that one can convert a rho tensor chi n into sigma tensor chi n. So that's why it's a very interesting example. We are not talking about something that doesn't exist. In 2003, Madame and Dylan showed that there are uh, embezzling families. So if one has this family of states, that works as an embezzling family with our definition. And uh, in our work, we tried to characterize all possible embezzling family. We first notice that we don't have to check all sigmas, but it's enough, enough to check the maximum entangled to qubit uh, state. And since we are dealing only with pure state, we can use the star conversion distance instead of the uh, standard dist uh, conversion distance. And so we say that Cayenne is a universal embedding family if the limit of the conversion distance, the star conversion distance goes, goes to zero. By using the formula uh, that we showed at the beginning for uh, the star conversion distance, we were able to prove this theorem. I skip uh, all the details, but the important thing of this theorem is that everything depends only on the original family. And it means that if you give me a family of state, I can, with a good amount of time, try and see where this goes. And they can answer the question, is this an embezzling family or not? The problem with that theorem is that, you know, we are talking about infinite families, and it may take me a very long amount of time to check all the states if there is no relation between one state and another. And so sometimes it's easier to talk about families that are defined from by a function. So here you see every entry, every coefficient is somehow defined by this function f, and the big f of n is just the normalization constant. As an example, we can. As an example, we can take the. It's now or that. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. That's uh, what is that from? That's a connection. Which connection? Is it this connection? Um. Uh, is this that connection? Okay. Well, what? Oh, it's getting worse and worse. Um, I know. So, okay. Um, <laughs> so we we'll try not to move too much. Maybe you don't want to influence the cables. So, to give an example of what we mean, we can define for every real number a family of states where the coefficients are x to the alpha. Okay, like. The Van Damme and was one over square root of x, so it was the special case when alpha was uh, minus one. And what we show that that is the only case in which we get an embezzling family. Okay, everything else, uh, the limit of that conversion distance is above zero, and it goes to zero only when alpha is equal to minus to minus one. Even even more generally, if we assume that f as a a reasonable asymptotic behavior. So what we mean with that, we take it to be asymptotically increasing. That's motivated by the fact that, for example, for x to the alpha, it could be non embezzling It could be embezzling only for smaller than uh, for x equal for alpha equal to minus one that is decreasing it. But also because we were able to rule out in our paper a lot of families that are actually increasing it. So we're assuming that it's asymptotically increasing and 
that that ratio is asymptotic monotonic for all alpha. Also, this thing is quite oh, maybe more. Also, this thing is uh, quite re is quite reasonable. We had to work hard to find an example of a function that is uh, non increasing but not monotonic for uh, for all alpha. So it's something that many of the functions that we commonly use uh, satisfy. Uh, then and that's the important result in the bit of suspense. <laughs> then the feminine states, I start to say it in order, uh, is a universal in basic family if it is close to the Van Damme and Dynan one. So if you remember the Van Damme one was one over square root of X. Here, what we are saying is that for every epsilon, those limits are, uh, are satisfied, which actually it means that for every epsilon, our function is bounded above from x to the minus one to the plus epsilon and bounded below or from x to the minus one minus epsilon. And so it's in between these two curves for uh, every epsilon. And this theorem, this, this result, uh, somehow includes uh, all the previously known embezzling family, the first one introduced by Van Damme and Dylan, and uh, all the embezzling families found by Leung and Wang that different from the fundamental Dylan just by logarithmic factor. And so if you add a logarithmic factor on top, you see that those, those ratios are, are satisfied. To conclude, what we did was to introduce a new conversion distance that works for pure states. It's equivalent to the standard one based on the trace distance, but we were able to find a close formal expression. And that's like, it's quite interesting because LOCC is usually tricky to, to deal with. And so we were happy to find this close form expression. Then we used this result for entanglement embezzlement. We provide that complete characterization in a sense that we are able to tell if one gives us a family state, we are able to tell if it's an embezzling family or not. And we showed that under reasonable assumption, the Van Damme and Dyden family is unique. So everything that is embezzling has to be very close to the Van Damme and Dyden embezzling family. What's, what's next from here? Well, we actually have uh, new results based on the star conversion distance. Uh, Thomas will present them at QIP uh, in, in January, and the work will be soon published on the, on the archive. But those, those results are still in, uh, in LOCC. Uh, very interesting question is what happens uh, to other naturalization-based resource theories? Because here for time, I didn't went into the details of the proof, but everything in base is based on majorization and specifically on approximate majorization. Makes sense because we want to do approximate conversion. And we know that thermodynamics, coherence, non uniformity are all based of, on majorization. So can we get some, something similar, some similar star conversion distance for those resource theories? And that's an interesting next topic. And thank you. Uh, thanks uh, very much for a nice talk. So uh, is there any questions? Uh, thanks for the talk. It's really nice. Um, you say you have like a complete characterization of universal embezzling family, right? But so far, as I understand, it only works for pure states, family of pure states. Can you say something about mixed states also? That's thank you. That, yeah, that's that's a great question. Yes. Um, for simplicity, we just consider families com com composed of pure states. We know nothing about uh, families composed by mixed states. And uh, uh, I'm not even so optimistic that we can say much about families composed by mixed state because that makes the problem in LCC much more difficult. Like with uh, fewer states, we were able to use majorization, Nielsen, and a lot of other known results with mixed state, it would be much more tricky to say something. But one important point is that with that family, you can still embezzle any mixed state. So even if the Embezzling family is made by pure state that doesn't change its universal power. Like in the definition, we used sigma, and that's any finite dimensional mixed state. 
Great, thank you. Um, you made the analogy um, for an investor with a catalyst. Um, let me suggest an alternative, which is that it's more like a, it's more like a battery. It's more like a battery for entanglement. And so even though the state doesn't change very much, you're using up entanglement in the investment state, you should think of it like um, a battery for entanglement. Just like, um, a, you know, in thermodynamics, the work system, if I consider a superposition over all possible energies, that state doesn't change very much when you use it as a battery, but it uh, uses up work. So I'm wondering if that's, if thinking about like a battery changes how you recharge it. Yeah. Uh, we didn't we didn't think uh, a lot in this term, so it's it's a very nice point of view, and we we want to be we, we want to think about that. The reason for which we didn't is that uh, I don't know that's not always the case, but you know batteries is even something that you take something from and you put something into maybe a later stage. To, uh, it's it's a battery you can charge it and uh, take it and take something out. Here we were only interested in one uh, uh, one direction. So just taking we have this big uh, family, we pick one of the states uh, and we use it as uh, to, to do our transformation. So we are just taking out an entanglement from that state, uh, but we are never putting it back in the battery. So that's why we didn't think in that, in that sense. Any other questions? All right, so if not, let's thank Elia again.